Okay. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the World Parks Academy webinar series. My name is Hannah Cleveland, and I'm hosting here from the Epley Institute for Parks and Public Lands at Indiana University. These webinars are brought to you in partnership with World Urban Parks, the International Organization for Parks and Recreation. So before I introduce our speaker today, I want to make sure that everyone can hear me. If you're having trouble with the sound, please send me a message in the chat box and I'll try to address the issue as soon as possible. If you have questions during the presentation, please save those until the end and type your question in the chat box. We will have 15 minutes after the presentation to answer your questions. If you would like to receive CEUs for this webinar, they are available on ProvalenceLearning.com upon registration and a small fee. If you have any questions about CEUs or the World Parks Academy webinars, you can contact me after the webinar at worldparksacademy at gmail.com. Now I would like to introduce our speaker today. We have Herman Enriquez uh, present, presenting the role of urban parks on climate change. Herman is the executive director of Leon Metropolitan Parks and he was recently awarded the Certified Park Professional Award from the World Parks Academy. He has a strong background in environmental and industrial engineering. And while based in Mexico now, he has spent several years working in Denmark on environmental projects. Herman is passionate about finding sustainable solutions to the issues we are facing today because of climate change. Thank you, Herman. I will now pass the mic to you. Thank you very much, Hannah. Well, first of all, uh, thank you everyone for uh, showing interest in this topic about climate change. And, our, and the role that we as uh, well somehow uh, involved in the parks uh, world uh, or industry as you want to call it uh, well we have a important uh, task in our hands uh, concerning what we can do about uh, well the climate conditions so um, yeah first of all I will just like to go through the through the index of the presentation I'm gonna uh, be talking about uh, first of all well uh, the context of Leon and uh, its metropolitan park so you can know where this case study was being done in case in uh, in terms of uh, how urban parks they can play a role in climate change afterwards we're going to see a little bit of uh, climate change a crash course uh, not, not more than five or ten minutes and then afterwards <clears throat> All these roles that we have identified of uh, urban parks and climate change, how they are uh, examples, uh, some examples that we are doing right now in the Leon Metropolitan Park. And we're going to finish with a model of how to quantify all these effects, <clears throat> all these, uh, how parks actually uh, mitigate or they emit uh, greenhouse gases that they uh, have an effect on climate change. And I'm going to share that with you. All right, so let's begin. So first of all, um, let's see, yeah, here we are. So this webinar is brought uh, to you by Warpox Academy. Thank you very much, Hannah, and all your team. It's been uh, really easy to, to give this webinar, thanks to you. Uh, well, all these uh, webinar basics that Hannah already talked to you about, well, using the chat box for expression. And also the CEUs that, well, I'm not an expert myself, so Hannah can answer that later. Right, so I'm going to start with an introduction to Leon. What is Leon? Well, Leon is a city in Mexico, and uh, well, it's like the fifth biggest city in Mexico. It is located right in the geographical center of Mexico. Uh, just a quick uh, recap of Mexico, it has 120 million uh, people, it's the 15th largest economy in the world, and Leon is the fifth largest city in, in Mexico. We have around uh, 1.8 million people in the metropolitan area. So uh, Leon is, is basically uh, sustained by, by the leather and footwear industry, but lately it has been, we have been receiving a lot of companies from Japan and the US uh, because of the automotive industry that is being going on. Um, also, we are really famous in Mexico because of uh, well, some attractions. It's, it has become a service city. I put in the center our local uh, football team because we went, we did really well <laughs> this last tournament. Otherwise, I wouldn't even mention it. But anyway, that is Leon. You are more than welcome to visit. And but now speaking about the climate in Leon because this is what we have been monitoring. Well, first of all, the difference between weather and climate 
is that weather is a short-term status of what is going on. For example, today it's sunny, but that doesn't mean that it's always sunny. And that is where climate it hits in. I mean, climate is the long-term statistics of how, uh, well, uh, certain the weather in a, in a location should, should behave. For example, here in Leon, in July, it should be really rainy. So the climate is rainy on summers, but today the weather is sunny. That is the difference. So when we speak about climate change, it doesn't mean like, oh, it's going to rain in the afternoon, so the climate is going to change. No, that is the weather. Climate is, if uh, suddenly it is, it is not rainy anymore in the summer in Leon, that would be climate change. So um, Leon is located in, as I was telling you, in the center of Mexico. It's quite high in terms of elevation. It's uh, almost 2,000 meters above sea level. We have a a temperate and subhumid uh, weather, which is the climate that I, want, <laughs> I was telling to you, a uh, temperature around, uh, well, in, in Fahrenheit, it would be around the 80s, 80s and uh, lows in the 60s. And uh, we have an annual precipitation of um, 700 millimeters. However, this is the, the statistics. What we have been seeing here in Leon is that, for example, uh, it should rain 700 millimeters, but last year, 2018, we registered more than 1,400 um, millimeters. So that's almost double. And that is quite, a, has a lot of effects in the city. Okay, so what is environmental diagnosis of our city? Well, we have four natural protected areas. One of them is the Leon Metropolitan Park. We have around an inventory of uh, 685 municipal, green municipal areas. Some of them are parks, some of them are just, well, land that is not being used at all. Um, the main source of emissions in terms of greenhouse gases is the energy sector, and we're really vulnerable to floods and droughts. And that is something that you can see in the Metropolitan Park, which is something that I'm going to be speaking a little bit later. All right, so what are the local challenges of our city? This is something that I would like to speak because it's pretty much the same challenges all over the world. It's not only, of course, that there is some some places that they have some of them more acute, like for example, water. I mean, Leon is located in a kind of desertic area, so all the water we get is from uh, groundwater. So if there is no more infiltration due to the lack of vegetation in the mountains, then uh, we're we're having some crisis about water, but waste management, air quality, energy, uh, the lack of green areas, and of course education, those are the main challenges that right now they are being worked in the region, but this is something that, as I was telling you before, it's, uh, I think it's a common thing in every single city in the world. Right, so now let's go to the good things. Metropolitan, uh, Leon's Metropolitan Park. Let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about it, uh, just for you to get familiarized when I start speaking about the different things that we are doing in the park in order to uh, educate climate change. Okay, so first of all, how big is this park? It's uh, 337 hectares. It's uh, quite big, and, uh, but it's mainly a reservoir dam. It's a, it's a water body that it's been adapted to being a park. So you could call it that it's a lake, surrounded by a track and a lot of different uh, recreational areas, and that is pretty much the Metropolitan Park of Leon. Okay, so here's a map of how it looks. This is um, when the dam is quite full, but it's quite a dynamic thing because in rainy season, well, it gets full, but in dry season, it actually gets, it doesn't dry at all, but uh, I mean, it's, it's quite different, the landscape. And imagine uh, having to manage uh, 60 hectares of a park, well, that's something, but if it gets dry, then you have to manage uh, almost 200 hectares of dry land and, well, costs increase of that. Right, so that is uh, the overview. Uh, also, there is something uh, special about this park, is that the three levels of government, they intervene in the single space, which makes it a little bit difficult to manage. For example, <clears throat> since it is a, a reservoir dam, it is pretty much uh, run by the federal, federal government. However, it is a natural protected area designed by the state. And the, the management, the, the institution which I work for, is actually a municipal uh, institution, which is the, the, the board of the Metropolitan Park. So imagine having to, uh, well, request
request a permit or something, you have to go through all levels of government, which makes it really fun. Okay, something that we are really proud here in, in our park is that it runs pretty much as a conservancy in terms that the executive board is uh, pretty much co uh, comprised of citizens. So the president and treasurer of my board, they are citizens, which makes it a little bit less political than other uh, public institutions. There is also councilmen in the, in the board and some members of the municipal cabinet, uh, the Minister of Environment and Tourism. Uh, however, the citizen part is the thing that uh, we are really proud of because we have been able to, well, stay aside of uh, political decisions that they have other goals. Right, so speaking a little bit more about the park, uh, we have more than one and a half million visitors per year. There is a lot of uh, park activities that you should, well, you're familiar with, like running, cycling, and a lot of outdoor activity, uh, kayaks, uh, trains, boats. It's a quite a lively place you're, that you're more than welcome to visit anytime. And also, this thing about being a natural protected area, uh, the park is is uh, 25 years old. It's actually a young, uh, young park. However, it has only been a natural protected area for the last 15 years. So it has been evolving all the management plan for the park, trying to go more into conservation. But uh, at the same time, I mean, uh, being the, recre the recreational area for Leon uh, by excellence. Okay, so we have a lot of critters in, the, in our park. We have a lot, around 200 species of, of, um, of animals, uh, especially birds. I mean, it's interesting how since the dam was built in 1953, I mean, I was telling you that the park is 25 years old. However, the dam, the lake as such, is uh, almost 70 years old. So when this was built, remember that I told you before that Leon was kind of a dry, desertic area. Well, uh, this lake that is almost 300 hectares, it actually had an influence in all the mig migratory uh, routes of a lot of birds. So right now we find almost uh, 160 species of birds and we have been discovering many more. I mean, we just had a flamingo. Uh, they just arrived to our park by natural means. So anyway, it's really interesting. And we also have a, uh, some mammals, like uh, some native species of uh, Tlacuache, we call them, which is kind of a skunk, kind of. Um, yeah, some amphibians, some fishes. And this is how it goes. In terms of trees, well, we have uh, almost uh, 14,000 uh, trees or 48 species. We're trying to be more um, active in, in, in terms of or more conscious about which species to plant because well native species they require less management less uh, input of resources and well also events uh, we host uh, the second largest uh, hot air balloon festival in the world which is called festival internacional del globo in that event is i mean this is an actual picture of how it looks like it it is quite a, a thing i mean having to manage a, a park that suddenly in just three days we receive half a million people so it's a lot of stress on the park we have been trying to put some uh, well to learn from the best you know how to manage these kind of uh, huge massive events uh, without affecting the environment of course but we also have a lot of different events such as well uh, cinema by the park and there, we used to have some motocross um, tournaments, not anymore because it was a little bit too rough on the natural areas, but anyway. And the management budget, I know that is really interesting for all of us park managers. Well, uh, we have a budget of two million US dollars a year. Uh, we pretty much, we have a fork, uh, workforce of 150 people, which uh, we are moving into the outsourcing uh, world, uh, which, well, it's been slow because there is not a lot of companies here in Leon that they are specialized in some, some of the aspects of park management that we would like. So uh, we are trying to migrate into a more lean uh, um, organization, but anyway, we're in the way. Right, so uh, we're also uh, members of the World One Parks, the national, uh, the NRPA of Mexico, which is called Asociación Nacional de Parques y Recreación, and recently City Parks Alliance, by the way, just a small, well, whatever, 
uh, see you next uh, next week on the City Parks Alliance Radar and Greener. We're going to be there. We're really excited about it. And also, well, uh, last year we won this uh, interesting and valuable large urban park uh, by the World Urban Parks Organization. This was a huge deal for us because, I mean, it has been really interesting to see how these awards they can help us to go to our local even national governments and say like, hey, uh, well, we have been recognized and uh, we have these needs, which are, well, in the best interest of uh, all the population here in Leon. So uh, it's been an interesting uh, tool in order to, to be more, to be heard in all these uh, councils. Right, so that is Metropolitan Park of Leon, and that is Leon. By now you should be already experts, almost tourist guides whenever you come here. But anyway, let's talk about the issue, the climate change. I mean, for most of you, I think that this is going to be just like a reminder. But anyway, nonetheless, it's really important for us to know what is uh, this thing that is being kind of a trendy word, climate change. Okay, so to speak about climate change, first of all, we need to speak about how the Earth, how the planet gets its energy, how we manage energy. Because when we speak about climate change, we speak about energy. So anyway... <clears throat> Most of the, well, 99.999% of the energy that we get uh, uh, in the Earth, we get it from the sun. This energy is actually, um, well, in the form of a, a radiation energy, and uh, it comes in different waves. I mean, for example, we, you're familiar with uh, microwaves, X-rays, and, uh, well, many of different, uh, these are the same energy, but just in different frequencies. What is going on is that the solar radiation, it uh, comes in, uh, in uh, infrared radiation, visible light, which is why we can actually see each other, because, I mean, this is the, the frequency that we, we as humans in our organs, our eyes, they can actually detect and distinguish, and also in ultraviolet radiation. Okay, so ultraviolet radiation has a, high, a higher frequency. This UV radiation is actually really harmful for humans. Why? Because it causes uh, too much energy. It actually burns us. So it's like uh, all these uh, skin cancer and all different uh, effects is due to this UV radiation. So what does the Earth, how does it handle this radiation? Well, for higher frequencies, this UV radiation, we have what is called the ozone layer. This ozone actually reflects most of this UV radiation, so that keeps us safe. What is the ozone layer made of? Ozone, which is uh, three, uh, uh, three, three atoms of oxygen. Then uh, we also have infrared radiation. Infrared radiation is actually a lower wavelength, but that is what uh, gives warmth to the Earth. I mean, so the Earth actually handled this, um, this wavelength by absorbing some of it and reflecting some other of it. So what is this uh, regulation mechanism that we have in the Earth in order to, to absorb or to reflect this radiation? Well, it's, they are called the greenhouse gases. It's a thin layer of, um, of some particular gases that depending on the thickness, it, uh, is, this is like the greenhouse effect. This is why it's called the greenhouse effect. I mean, imagine as uh, any greenhouse that you have glass, and depending on how thick the glass is, how much uh, energy you want to be absorbing the inside of the, of the greenhouse. So um, it's the same here. I mean, we have a certain equilibrium of uh, this greenhouse gas layer that uh, for many years, I mean, it has been changing. I mean, climate as we know it nowadays, it has never been like, it, it's not a stationary, it's always changing. So, uh, for example, right in the beginning when the Earth was formed 4.5 billion years ago, well, there was almost no atmosphere. Then the atmosphere started being created and so on, so on, so So, uh, right now, uh, the human species in this era that it has been going around for almost uh, some, millions, some uh, millions of years, well, we have been managing to uh, create, to leave as we know, due to the temperature of the Earth, which is uh, around 14 degrees Celsius. Okay, so what determines this temperature is the amount of gases that they're in this layer. Right, so, um, yeah, 
uh, this radiation, as I tell you, it could be bounced or it could be absorbed. So now, what are these gases that we uh, that determine this uh, this this layer? Well, they are called the greenhouse gases, and you might see that where there is uh, water vapor, carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, ozone, and chlorofluorocarbons. Well, water vapor is the single most important one because this layer of greenhouse gases is made by 60% uh, water vapor. So you might say, okay, every time that it rains or that it evaporates, it's a greenhouse gas. Yes, it is, but however, it's in, in equilibrium. I mean, there is the right amount of, uh, of these uh, uh, molecules in the atmosphere. What happens if we start emitting more of these gases and make this layer, layer thicker? Well, then that means that we are absorbing more of this radiation, the infrared radiation. And that is what, what is causing a global warming. So anyways, just how to maintain this balance on the layer of greenhouse gases. So just to make a little bit of a thing, uh, water vapor, as I was telling you, this part of the natural water cycle of the Earth. Then we have carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is, is an essential element for life. I mean, everybody breathe in and exhale. When we exhale, this is carbon dioxide when we're ex exhaling. So is that bad for the environment? Well, no, because that is natural carbon. But imagine that uh, we're, well, sending some amount of carbon to the atmosphere, and then suddenly we start extracting a carbon that is really deep inside the earth, and we start burning and releasing even more carbon. Now that is the thing, that that is where we are breaking the balance. We are breaking the equilibrium when we add more carbon than the, than the one that we, that we have already. Methane is also, um, carbon molecule, but it's, it's produced by natural degradation of organic matter. Nitrous oxide, well, that is also another greenhouse gas. Ozone in the lower layers of the atmosphere, not in the ozone layer, which is in the stratosphere or in the troposphere, that is also greenhouse gas. And chlorofluorocarbons, that they're the really bad guys, that they not only were uh, killing the ozone layer, but they, were, they are also a really potent greenhouse gas. All right, so what causes these extra amounts of gases that they are making the greenhouse uh, layer uh, thicker and pr uh, promoting uh, global warming? Well, uh, carbon dioxide is the main, main emission that we as human activity are, are doing, mainly by transportation, by the way that we get electricity and heat. I mean, all these thermoelectric plants that we burn coal or oil in order to produce heat uh, or electricity, <coughs> fuels, industry. All of these have an emissions of uh, carbon dioxide. Also, uh, methane, well, agriculture, waste, um, nitrous oxide, it also um, wastewater treatment plants, agriculture as well. So there's a lot of activities they have an impact of how many gases we are actually releasing, right? So all these gases, and this is also very important, I mean, we take as, as um, like the normal currency, carbon dioxide. But for example, uh, right now, take uh, into an example the, the money and economic currencies, well, one US dollar is equal to 20 Mexican pesos. At least now I haven't checked, but things are going crazy. But anyway, uh, for example, one kilogram of methane is equal to 25 kilograms of, of carbon dioxide in terms of the global warming potential. So for example, one kilogram of methane is more harmful for this effect of climate change than one kilogram of carbon dioxide. How many times? 25. What about nitrous, nitrous oxide? Well, what, that is almost 300 times. What about uh, chlorofluorocarbons? These really bad guys. Well, there is almost thousands of times of carbon dioxide. So it depends which substance is the one that we are emitting. Right, so what is gonna happen? What is going on in climate change right now? And this is something we need to update every single month because things are going really fast. But anyway, right now I'm going to tell you a little bit of the predicted outcome, outcomes of uh, what happens if this, because of this uh, thickening of this greenhouse uh, gas layer that the global the, the the Earth is warming up because we're absorbing more of this energy from the sun. So right now, I mean, I, I told you before the industrial times that is around the 1900, uh, 1800s. Well, the temperature of the Earth was in an average of 14 degrees. So these 14 degrees Celsius, uh, we have been monitoring how much um, the average temperature of the Earth, how it has been increasing or, or decreasing depending on 
on also some on, some other natural phenomena. But since the 70s, we have uh, registered a really high uh, climb of, of uh, uh, a really rapid increase of this temperature. So what would happen? What is happening actually right now that we are one degree Celsius above these pre-industrial levels of, uh, uh, of temperature? Well, first of all, the Andes glaciers, they are already melting. I had the opportunity of being in the city of Mendoza, Argentina, uh, last month, and you, have, you can see the effects now. Uh, Mendoza, Argentina is a city that it depends mostly on all the, all the water from the glaciers of the Andes. And these, these glaciers are becoming smaller and smaller every single year. So that is a an, an threat, I mean, a really urgent threat there. Also, I mean, there has been a lot of climate-related threats uh, per year, I mean, due to some uh, diseases like malaria and stuff like that, because uh, hot weather will, it also encourages all other kinds of diseases. And the uh, coral reefs that they are, uh, well, most of them are almost bleach. Why, why do they turn into this white color? Well, it means because uh, the biggest sinkhole of uh, carbon is the ocean. So when we emit a lot of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, the ocean also absorbs a lot, and it transforms it into carbonic acid, which changes the acidity of the ocean, and this can happens. Why are coral reefs important? Because they, well, they are home to most of the species of, of, uh, of the ocean in the Earth. What happens, what would happen if we reach the two degrees Celsius? Well, first of all, a lot of less fresh water available because of the melting of the glaciers, more malaria, and no more Christmas as we know it, because there wouldn't be any more reindeers and polar bears, which is uh, just uh, it's just one of the things, but it's many more. Now, these two degrees is actually the, the point of return, because if we reach two degrees Celsius, then that means that there is a positive feedback effect with water. Remember that I told you 60% of the uh, greenhouse gases, of the composition of the atmosphere, of greenhouse gases is water vapor. Now, if the uh, temperature increases to two degrees, that means that the earth is warmer. If the earth is warmer, it evaporates more water. If there is more water in the atmosphere, it creates more of a greenhouse effect, therefore causing that the earth becomes even more warmer. So that is a positive feedback uh, loop that, well, they would accelerate on its own. We are really cautious of not to reach two degrees Celsius above the pre-industrial levels. Uh, three degrees Celsius, I'm going to be go a little bit fast so we can go into the park stuff. Um, well, many be bad things. Four degrees Celsius, more bad things. Uh, agriculture would stop in Australia, which is really important. 50% uh, less fresh water available. And five degrees Celsius, this is just apocalyptic predictions. But anyway, most of the coastal cities of the world would be underwater, which that means well, a lot of uh, climate migration, which we have already been seeing. And what is being done now? Well, in 2015, in the Conference of Paris by the UN, there was this thing called the Paris Agreement, where most of the countries of the world, they got together and say, okay, let's make a, uh, a deal where uh, we will try to limit our emissions, our carbon emissions, greenhouse gas emissions, uh, in order not to reach the point of no return, which is two degrees Celsius above the pre-industrial levels. Uh, what is going on with this? Uh, everything was joy and, and marvelous stuff. However, there was a big flaw in this agreement, is that there is absol absolutely no penalties about it. So, uh, I mean, the US is already on the, on the way out, and uh, many other countries, they just signed, but they didn't ratify, and there is not a lot of progress that is being seen, so, Anyway, this needs to be addressed immediately, but anyway. So, what is the role of urban parks in all of these that I have been telling you before on climate change? Well, first of all, parks, we know them uh, stereotypically, they are, they are uh, being uh, presented as the lungs of the cities, that they provide all the oxygen of the cities. Is that true? Well, we need to measure that, and this is what we have been doing in, uh, in Leon. The results, well, I won't spoil you, but they are not really encouraging. Anyway, something that is really important in cities, in nations, in all these geographical areas is that to get the, the idea that everything is connected. 
So it's not only about uh, trees and water, but also humans, birds, and I mean, there is connections all the time. So if you, if you have an impact on a, an element of the system, it will have more impacts in other, in other elements. And this is something really important, which is called the systemic um, uh, systems thinking. So what are the roles that we identify in climate change? Well, first of all, education. That is the thing that we can do the most. I'm going to show you some this. Then mitigation and adaptation as well. Let me now go into the case study of Leon and the Leon Metropolitan Park to show you why these three roles, education, mitigation, and adaptation. To speak of adaptation, how the cities can adapt to the effects of climate change, uh, the, story, the story of Leon is actually quite uh, interesting. In, in the late 1800s, Leon was continuously being flooded by all the rain that was, uh, all the water that came from the mountains. So there was a lot of these uh, flood events. That they were actually quite catastrophic. They had a lot of deaths. In order to prevent that, in 1953, there was, um, uh, let me see if you can see my cursor. Yeah, here we go. So this is Leon. Um, and here, uh, the green circle, and that's the Metropolitan Park of Leon. This dam was, was built in order to contain all the water that was flowing from the mountains before it reached the city. So it, it is kind of a superhero of the town. And then, 40 years later, well, it, was become, it became a park. However, this is a picture, the one in the, in the right, of uh, two years ago, or even one year ago. I mean, it was almost the same, the same effect. Uh, we need more of these parks. Why? Because the weather is changing. So the weather is changing, the climate is changing. So all these events, in order to prevent these floodings, uh, parks such as, as the Metropolitan Park can, can be built in order to, to make the cities more resilient to these effects, in, for example, of flooding. This is what in, in Denmark they are actually doing. I mean, I had the opportunity of leave, to leave there and they are do, do, doing these uh, kind of uh, parks that they, that they work as, as storm water basins. But when there is no rain, they, they, they can be used as parks. So this is some, an example of adaptation, how the cities can adapt to the climate effects, the climate change effects. Then education, in terms of uh, indicators, well, the, the Leon Metropolitan Park is a great example of how uh, the, the, the conditions, the weather conditions, because of the climate, are in the city. Uh, for example, here we can see in the left, this is uh, last year actually when we had the, 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 the dam was at 140% of its capacity, so it was pretty much flooded. And then six years ago, uh, the dam was completely uh, dry. So this is something that every single visitor, every person that goes to the park, they can see, they can live, they can know how, how the climate is changing. And also through open data, for example, these are all the levels of, of the dam throughout the year. We have been sharing these with the, with the people so they can know, they can know that, okay, it's a dry year, it's a wet year. Uh, why is that? Is this normal? Is it not? And well, I think parks are a great way of showing this. Then bird migration, this is also something that I was telling you before. Uh, birds, they don't care about borders. I mean, it doesn't matter if there is a wall, if there is passport or visa, I mean, they can fly. So anyway, uh, they usually go to the environments that they fit the most. So in this case, I was telling you that by the construction of this lake, there was a lot of different birds that said, okay, this is a nice place, let's go and live there. And we have been uh, monitoring all the species that we have week by week. And we have been detecting, like for example, 20 new species this last year, which is a lot of different species that we had before. In the right, I show a conversation I had with Scott Martin, which is, I'm really glad that he's actually here uh, listening to me. Anyway, uh, he told me that there was these house ranches that they just arrived to, uh, to, his, uh, to his park. And he was like, By, are you missing some of them? And actually, yes, we were missing some of them. So we call them chivirines over here. But this kind of uh, collaboration between uh, all different uh, natural corridors of, of the continents or even the world, I think they can be really good in, uh, means of educating the people, of showing how we need to observe nature in order to know how is it changing and then adapt to it. Then uh, tree status also, I mean, because of the warming of, of some cities, we have been uh, 
looking at some plagues, some different effects that we didn't have before. So, for example, mistletoe, what in uh, Great Britain and all these uh, really amazing uh, plant because you can kiss in Christmas or whatever. Well, over here is a plague and a really bad one. Why? Because it does not die in winter because our weather, our climate is actually warmer. So we have been dealing with that and it's killing a lot of trees. So anyway, people need to know about how uh, the effects of this changing of, of climate. Uh, also, I mean, uh, it's really important to go to native species when we are uh, considering planting trees in order to, to avoid bad habits. I mean, the picture of the left is not actually Mexico, I don't know where it's from, but anyway, it's some of the things that we should prevent in parks, uh, not to do bad, uh, well, wrong, wrong, wrong kinds of stuff. Right, so also waste management. Waste is one of the main sources of methane uh, with this greenhouse gas. So in the park, we, we implemented this uh, zero waste uh, plan, which the objective is, act is that not not a single residue that is being produced in the park to be sent to the landfill. So this plan uh, contains waste sorting, compost, non-recyclable waste restriction for event organizers or whoever wants to do something in the park, you cannot use some materials and also some workshops. In the compost, well, here we are pretty much well dealing with compost, but in a really flashy way so people can take a look at it. And we are also importing uh, waste, not only produced in the park, but also from the vicinities. Uh, this is another great idea of waste management that is being implemented in the zoo in, in Leon. It's another park here, which is actually by a biodigester of the excretes of the animals where they are being transformed into, into well, biogas. And this biogas through a generator, it produces electricity. How can you reach people in order to tell them that this kind of electricity is really important? Well, what about cell phones? Everybody's really looking for where can I charge my cell phone, whatever. What about if you charge your cell phone with poo from the elephant? Well, that is something traumatic and also really good in terms of educational impact. Workshops about uh, how to grow, uh, how uh, sustainable development is being done. I mean, nothing uh, out of, of the ordinary here. Uh, right now, we're uh, redoing our educational program in terms of uh, focusing on sustainable development thanks uh, with uh, some support of the Engagement Global from Germany and the Education for Sustainable Development Expertnet. We're just trying to focus on the SDGs and the sustainable development goals, especially the ones that they are uh, really deep into the park, like uh, 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 inclusion, uh, life on land, alliances for objectives, but also considering all of the other ones. Also changing uh, the traditional thinking scheme of education to systems thinking to see how everything is connected. And also every single project that we do, we're trying to put the sustainable project management uh, framework, which is pretty much engage with the stakeholders. I mean, that is one of the main things. And also uh, developing competencies, uh, compet these competencies that are uh, focused on sustainable development. Anyway, this is pretty much part of the education programs that we're running in the park. And now finally, just to end, I would like to show you in terms of mitigation, the greenhouse gases assessment model for urban parks that we did in partnership with Tecnológico de Monterrey, University here in Mexico and the University of Tennessee in the US. So first of all, this model for urban parks, it uh, has three different uh, steps. The first one, it was to identify which greenhouse gases are being emitted by operating the park. Second is to calculate how many greenhouse gases we're actually absorbing or mitigating because of the natural elements of our park. And the third one, it was to make a model uh, out of it so you can actually use it. So the first one, well, first of all, the characteristics of, of the park, we have already been through it, but anyway, it's important to know that it is a dynamic characteristic. I mean, some parts of the year we have more water than less water, and it has a huge impact on, on the mitigation uh, capacities. Okay, so the emission summaries here, I think that most of you are going to be feel related. So operating a park, how much emissions do we do? Because it's not only good things. I mean, it's not only that we absorb greenhouse gases, we also emit gases because we use energy. So for example, electric power uh, here in, Le in the Metropolitan Park of Leon, 
242,000 kilowatt hour. If we take the energy mix in Mexico, that one kilowatt hour produced in Mexico emits uh, almost half a kilo of carbon dioxide, we got the uh, annual emissions by using electric power, which in this case was 100, uh, 110 tons of CO2. Then fuel, this is something that we can all, well, take a look at, uh, measure. How much gasoline, how much diesel, how, how much gas we use, and this also has a, a direct relation to how much CO2 you're emitting. And then number three is how much waste is being generated. Not just, uh, and not in but organic waste because is the one that actually creates these greenhouse gases. Well, here uh, we take uh, samples and for a whole year. We realized that we were producing almost one uh, one thousand tons of organic food, or it, it was being wasted. So uh, that equivalent it is equivalent to a hundred, uh, well, sixteen hundred uh, kilograms of of methane, which, as I was telling you before, one kilogram of methane is equal to 25-ish uh, kilograms CO2. So there we have the numbers. Then, how much do we mitigate? And this is where it gets really interesting. So trees, we know that trees, they have this mitigation effect. We know that trees, they absorb carbon. But how much? Well, using the platform iTree, which I completely recommend, uh, you can get a carbon inventory of all the different species by making a census of all the trees that you have in, in your park. Here we got, uh, long story short, uh, 567 tons of CO2 uh, of carbon sequestration per year. This is a really interesting number because it changes a lot. I mean, depending on trees that are young, that they are old, but that is a complete different uh, webinar that we could spend hours talking about. Anyway, just plain simple, the 567 tons of CO2. Water bodies, they also, uh, I was telling you that the ocean, it's absorbing a lot of CO2. Well, if you have a big lake or a dam or whatever, it also absorbs some of uh, some of the carbon. Here we use some rates. Of, I, I will tell you the reference of an Egypt study of uh, how many grams of CO2 per per square meter is not even uh, it's a superficial matter. It's not a volumetric matter. But anyway, we find out that is because of the average uh, water level of, of the park. It's uh, uh, 15 tons of CO2. And finally, we have been implementing a lot of. Uh, uh, solar panels and alternative energy, renewable energy uh, things. So anyway, through this capacity, we reach 3.7 tons of CO2. So now the model prototype, which is where we, where we end up with this research, is that uh, we're taking the unit of CO2 as the, as the main unit for this study. So how much is being emitted by electric power? Here in this uh, little model that I can share with you, I mean, how many electronic devices, how many illumination, uh, hours of illumination do you, uh, you produce? Uh, are you consuming actually? How, many en how much energy generation, which that has a, a negative effect on how much electric power you're using because it actually you're saving energy by generating energy. Electric vehicles, that all has an amount of CO2. Then fuel, irrigation, water pumps, gathering devices, surveillance shifts, uh, because, well, if you don't use electric uh, vehicles, uh, land transport vehicles, water transport, uh, liters of fuel, and therefore uh, CO2. Then tree inventory that has a negative effect on the CO2 emitted, so you are actually mitigating uh, CO2. Water reservoirs, in case you have. And also organic waste, which is uh, uh, related to the amount of visitors that you get. And also, if you're producing compost, that is mitigating because then you are uh, not producing methane but transforming into carbon dioxide. So this is like the big uh, overall model that we reach that uh, probably a lot of parks have this model but more developed. This kind of like an emerging, emerging cities model for <laughs> uh, climate effects and by uh, urban parks. So the case study results. So here in the left column, we have uh, how much CO2 we are emitting by operating park, and in the right we have how much carbon we are actually saving or consuming or sequestrating by having all these natural elements of the park. So the big result is a positive that the Metropolitan Park of Leon it contributes with the mitigation of 391 tons of CO2 equivalent. 
is that a lot? Are we safe? Now we can just say whatever, we can do whatever because the park is there. Well, actually not. It's, you think about it, the equivalences, it, there are, it's actually not that much. For example, this amount is equivalent of taking just 85 parts of the road, reducing or reducing 20 trucks of waste or supplying or, I mean, kind of making up for the 60 households annual use of electricity or 112,000 barbecues. It's not at all. It's not, it's not too much. I mean, so what can we do? I mean, because, for example, Leon, 321 tons of CO2 that we are saving. How much Leon is emitting per year? Five million. So this is important whenever we say that the, that the parks are the lungs of, of, of the cities. Well, it is not so true. I mean, so instead of, uh, of just pretending that everything is all right, governments and us and initiatives should be focused more in terms of climate change on prevention of these emissions than just uh, corrections, which is pretty much, uh, I mean, these elements. So the conclusions, well, what are the roles that we identified in urban parks and climate change? Yes, mitigation to a certain extent, adaptation, of course, because of the effects, but mainly education. All the people who go to the parks, they can be in touch with the natural elements and they can actually live and know how, uh, what are the effects of this climate change in, in the, our respective cities. And they are more eager to learn about what is, it ha why is, wh what is going on and, of course, how they, through changing their behaviors, uh, they can actually uh, contribute. Also, well, the conclusion is this uh, model that we run, uh, well, it's, uh, isn't, we are updating it, and I know that a lot, a lot of the questions are going to be about, have you considered parking spaces and stuff like that? We're in the process of updating it, but every single input is valuable. I mean, this is just the first approach to this model that I think it can be really useful for a lot of parks to have these numbers. And these numbers, well, they have uh, a lot more uh, strength whenever you are negotiating with governments or whatever, what are the effects of, uh, of parks and cities. And finally, well, pretty much everything is connected. I mean, parks are such an important part of cities that we need to take care of them, but also we need to monitor and learn from them. So thank you very much for uh, listening to, to this webinar. And uh, I guess that now is the time for questions. Over to you, Hannah. <laughs> Yes, thank you, Herman, for sharing with us today about Leon Parks and climate change. I hope that everyone here finds a way to integrate this int information into the management of your own parks and that you can continue to learn more about this important topic. So we now have um, almost 10 minutes. Um, you can type any questions that you might have into the chat box. And feel free, if you speak Spanish, to type them in Spanish or English. We can answer them either way. Oh, yeah. Even French. <laughs> as I mentioned earlier, CEUs, or as we call them at the World Parks Academy, continuing professional development hours, are available on our learning management site. Um, it's just a short assessment that we've put together based on this presentation and a $15 fee, and you'll be able to have access to those. All right. So do you have a question, Hannah? <laughs> Um, yes, I do actually. I was wondering um, if you might talk more about some of the climate related educational programs that you may have implemented in Leon Parks or plan to. And then the second part of the question, if possible, would be how would you go about measuring the success of these programs? Yeah, sure. Well, um, about these uh, educational programs on, on climate. Yeah, uh, more than anything, we're focusing on a single element of, of, of the effects of climate change. I mean, more than explaining all the climate uh, 
climate itself because I mean our objective uh, our how do you say it, our target is pretty much uh, children and young adults well they are more focusing on things that they can actually leave and see and smell or whatever so birds are being quite an interesting topic that we are being developing I mean to showing all the migration routes of birds and how uh, depending on the season well which kind of birds they are seeing and through that we can actually explain how uh, climate works because for example these flamingos that we are observing right now I mean we have two flamingos now. One of them is an American flamingo that came to the park like two years ago, and just three weeks ago we have a Chilean flamingo. I think it's one of the few places in the world where you can see actually the two of them, and they became a gang. You know how it happens in parks. So you don't control these, but suddenly you got a whole show going on of these two flamingos well, just killing it in the lake, and everybody's amazing. So we're using that in terms of and uh, okay now there is a lot of uh, questions. thank you and if you could please translate the questions that would be helpful yeah sure uh, so Alicia she says that in a dry year uh, since the water levels they, they lower how how are we using the, the uncovered space that is being behind because it's not covered by water any, anymore. Chihuahua, which is a region, a region in Mexico, which is uh, right in the middle of the desert, they have a similar problem because the dam, uh, it floods in the, yeah. Okay, so here uh, in Leon, we are, all the architecture that we are actually using for, for the dam, first of all, you cannot build things inside of the dam because of the national water regulation. Uh, one of the things that has been uh, really good for us is to think of the of the park or as a as a dock. So everything is like semi fixed architecture. So uh, yeah, because if you build things inside of the of the dam, it's uh, when it gets flooded, it's going to be corroded and it's going to be uh, damaged. So uh, semi fixed architecture is so one of the things that is is actually working for us very much. So how does it it happens well if the bench will just take the bench out and then you, you put the bench in so it's like a transformer kind of it alicia okay uh maria tells us if there is if they can access the mitigation study yeah yeah of course i will i will write my my email here in the in the chat room so you can actually or well if this is being recorded then uh you can contact me by german enriquez okay that's pretty spanish uh, at parquemetroleon.com. I will write it now here. So yeah, please. Um, okay, let's see. There we go. So yeah, you can access this study, at least the, the first draft. We're now doing a, an, an update. Then is the use of pesticides and fertilizer taking into account in emission calculations? No, not yet. Uh, we actually use a lot of them. So the amount was not more, a more intensive use of these kind of uh, pesticides and fertilizers, and definitely should be taken into account. But in our case, we don't, so that's why we, we didn't uh, include them. Then Margarita tells us uh, that if there is, uh, if there, there will be access to the presentation to share with other people, of course, yeah, I can send it to you, or I don't know if through platform you can get it or otherwise there is my emails no worries then maria sells again uh, the studies the study the studies um, has been published is it uh, available to replicate in other parts yes it is and uh, i will sell you it's actually an excel uh, file so it's pretty easy to share so then again reach me through the email and i can share with you are these carbon credits then, uh, sorry, Gustavo says, are these carbon credits certified? Do you sell it? Who has bought? Sadly, uh, here in Mexico, we are still struggling a little bit with the carbon market because uh, we need to find the, the intermediary, the national uh, well, mechanism to, to get into the carbon market, which we haven't been really uh, having success at it, but we're working on it. 
if you have any information that we could actually use from uh, practices from other countries, we would really appreciate it. Then Giancarlo says, when you design these uh, floated parks, is it some guidelines to use or you just try to fit the more capacity you can? Okay, uh, speaking about designing parks, I mean, sadly, our park was not designed per se. I mean, it was just like uh, our master plan is from 2012. So it's kind of a late uh, master plan of architecture. It was just being built as, well, people thought that things were cool. But right now, I mean, I think that there definitely should be a, a discipline of fluted parks uh, architecture. I mean, that would be really interesting. But uh, as well, what we have been learning is that we have to learn from uh, from coastal cities. I mean, how this architecture, these docks that you find, this semi-fixed architecture, how it can be done. Because, yeah, as I was telling you before, I mean, right now that the uh, the dam is also almost at 80% capacity. We have around 60 hectares to manage. But if it goes down to 40% 40, 40 capacity, it, uh, it's almost uh, 150 hectares to manage. So it is really a, a thing to, to, be, to be aware of. But then uh, Chantal, uh, she says, could it be possible to identify which native trees absorb more CO2 and maybe use them more as a way to enhance carbon infiltration, definitely. I mean, and also um, the age of the tree, I mean, depending of the, of course, of the young trees, uh, they absorb more carbon because they actually use it for growth. There is, is, um, is something that depend, depending on the region, um, you can find the, the most uh, fit uh, tree to, to different parts. This uh, opens a lot of collaboration with the environmental departments in every region. I mean, this has to be, I mean, it's not only the park which will make the difference. I was telling you before, 390 tons of CO2 per year is it's almost nothing. But if we use the parks as models of how things should be designed in a way of uh, carbon sequestration, so they can be actually replicated in bigger areas like national parks or even in urban environments, now that is a greater effect than just uh, designing the park for it to be the 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 medicine for for this climate um, these greenhouse gas emissions but yeah definitely uh, I guess that a lot of alliances with environmental associations departments organizations is really good so more than just uh, actually absorbing the carbon people that go to the park they can actually see why the, these matters that uh, trees are not there just because they're pretty or okay I'm gonna plant a palm tree in the, in the middle of a, of a mountain area because it looks great that it has everything is connected and somehow i think that parks the the greatest uh, effect they can have on us is the impact of education when we go there right so i hope that i answer pretty much most of it otherwise uh, there is my my email please send me all your questions and let's see how we can make this model better i mean as i told you before we are right now considering how people get to the park. For example, should we take into account if people go into the park by car? So then all these carbon emissions are part of the park. And there is a lot of debate about it. But anyway, I think the more you quantify, the more, the more you measure, the more tools you can have and, well, better uh, strategies you can implement to educate people. OK, two minutes to 11. So um, anyway, we'll be around in, the, in Denver next week. I hope to see a lot of you over there. Otherwise, uh, next year, we're going to have a Congress in Leon, which is the, the regional Congress of Urban Parks in June. So I wish that you can all see uh, how we're implementing this in the Metropolitan Park of Leon. So we invite you to, uh, to, this, to this Congress that we're going to have. And finally, Margarita tells us, uh, we try to use i3, but we have the inconvenience that not all the species are included of a lot of, our, of trees in Mexico. How do we apply it? Okay, yeah, uh, we actually got in touch with the developers and we had uh, some extra species being mapped. But um, anyway, Margarita, we can definitely have this conversation a little bit longer in another time. But yeah, I mean, i3, 
it's a great tool for for this and it's not that hard to use so i highly recommend it okay so um any other question thank you guys i mean it's amazing to speak about this topic because we have a lot of uh, of influence in our city so let's start focusing on things that well we are focusing on things that matter but uh, there are other things that we are we need to be really concerned of and climate change is a reality is not something of an opinion or whatever and uh, the the best place to know how the effects are, are, are actually taking a toll in our cities our parks so glad to 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 share my experience with you Great. Thank you so much, Herman, for sharing with us and everyone for participating today. Um, please look out for these monthly webinars. We are coordinating them every month and posting them on the World Parks Academy website. So if you have any questions, just contact us. Otherwise, um, thank you. Thank you. Have a nice park life. <laughs>